My name is Rick Renner, and today, once again, I'm in the Titus Tunnel, which is near the ancient port of Cilicia in what is today southern Turkey. This was carved out of rock. This is not natural. This enormous place. It is 18 feet wide, 21 feet tall. This was carved out of rock with hammers and chisels, primarily by Jews. Then it was continued by Christians. It began during the time of the Emperor Vespasian. It was continued during the time of Titus, continued through the time of Domitian, but it's called the Titus Tunnel because the primary work happened during the time of Titus. Christian brothers and sisters were assigned to this place to work on the construction of this tunnel simply because they were Christians. They were being persecuted for their faith. And I'm sure they were wondering, are we ever going to get out of this mess? Maybe you've asked the same question about the mess that you're in. Maybe you're in a very deep, difficult place. I doubt seriously you are consigned to a tunnel like this. But nonetheless, what you're feeling is very serious and you feel it very deeply. How do you get out of your mess? You have to have the right attitude to get out of trouble. And the right attitude is found in James chapter 1, verse 2, when James is writing to readers who are also struggling. And he says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations. Oh, how do you count it joy when you're in a trap? How do you count it joy when you're in a deep, dark, difficult place? There's a way to do it. And if you have this right attitude, your right attitude is the first step to getting you out of your mess. And that is what I'm going to talk to you about today. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insight and understanding from the Word of God. Here's Rick. Hey, this is Rick Renner, and I've been waiting for you. Today, we're going to jump right back into James chapter 1, where we're studying how to get out of any trap the devil has set for you. Has the devil tried to trap you? Do you feel like you're stuck in a mess and you don't know how to get out? Well, today's program is going to really help you. So stay with me all the way to the end. You know, in the beginning of today's program, I was standing in the great Titus Tunnel, which is in southern Turkey, right on the border of Syria. That place is horrific. Actually, it's beautiful today, but when you think of what happened there 2,000 years ago, it was simply horrific. It's estimated that 10,000 Christians at a time were working to carve that tunnel with hammers and chisels, and they did it for 100 years, eating only bread and water, giving their lives to carve that tunnel out of rock. Well, you may not be in a place like that, but if you're in trouble, you feel like you're in a very deep, dark place. I know that. And the Word of God has answers for you, which you're going to find today. And if you need somebody to pray with you, remember, we are always here for you, and we would love to pray with you. Also, I want to remind you that I'm offering you my series right now called How to Get Out of the Trap the Devil Set for You. The back of the series says, There's a Way Out of Your Trap. It's a five-part series. It comes in multiple formats. It's based on these programs, and it's just terrific. And it comes with a wonderful study guide. By the way, if you're interested, on our website, we list all the study guides that are available from our ministry. There are so many. These are perfect for a Bible study, for your personal study, or if you're discipling someone else. They are just amazing, real treasures. We're also offering you my book right now, which is called Life in the Combat Zone, how to Survive, Thrive, and Overcome in the Midst of Difficult Situations. It doesn't matter what you're facing, you have a faith that overcomes your situation, a faith that overcomes the world. You just need to know how to use your faith to overcome the situation that you're facing, and that's what this book is about. Life in the Combat Zone. Order your copy today. But let's jump right back into James chapter 1. I just love the book of James. James was the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, and so he really speaks with a pastoral heart. And today I want us to begin again in James chapter 1 and verse 1. It begins by saying, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, 
greeting. And today I want us to begin by focusing on those words scattered abroad. We've seen in the two previous programs, in Greek, this is the word diasporia, and this is very important. The word diasporia describes the process of planting seed. In the world of the first century, there were primarily two ways to plant seed. First, you would take one seed and would plant one after another in a nice, neat, orderly row. That was one method of planting seed. But the word used here, the Greek word diasporia, does not describe that method. This describes one who puts his hand into a satchel of seed, he grabs a whole handful of seed, and then with no rhyme or reason, he just begins to randomly scatter it all over a field, throwing a little here, throwing a little there, the random scattering of seed. And now James uses this word to describe what has happened to his readers. These are believers who have suffered persecution, and they've been ripped out of their homes and randomly scattered all over the lands of the eastern part of the Roman Empire. And this scattering began in Acts chapter 8, verse 31. So very quickly, let's review over in Acts chapter 8 and verse 1. And in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, the Bible says, And Saul was consenting unto his death. It's talking about Stephen's death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. We've already seen that in Greek, the words great persecution really means a great hunt. This was a great hunt for believers in the city of Jerusalem. And when you study Acts chapter 8, verse 3, we find the hunt was led by Saul of Tarsus, and he was literally going from house to house looking for any evidence of Christians that he might eliminate them. And the Bible tells us at that time, believers were all scattered abroad throughout Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. These believers literally ran for their lives because of the persecution which was taking place. And when they were scattered abroad, they lost their homes, they lost their jobs, they lost their finances. In many cases, they were scattered abroad so quickly, randomly, they couldn't even find other members of their families. One scattered here, another scattered there. This truly was a tragedy that had happened to the believers in the first century. And this is who James is writing to in James chapter 1, to believers that had been scattered abroad. These are suffering Christians. And now these believers are writing to James. And we know exactly what they're saying to James because he quotes them in verse 13. Look at James chapter 1, verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. And you understand in Greek it means neither tempts any man with evil. But let's take this verse apart. First of all, he says, let no man say. In Greek, this is a very strong prohibition, which means James was forbidding them to say what they were saying. Let no man say, could be translated, I hear what you're saying, I don't agree with what you're saying, how dare you say it, let no man say. He is literally prohibiting them from some kind of talk. Well, what are they saying that is so wrong that causes James to speak up and say, stop it, stop it now, I don't want to hear this anymore? Then he quotes them. Let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. That's what they were saying. God is tempting us. Well, when James says, let no man say when he's tempted of God, that word tempted is the Greek word pirazo. The word pirazo is a word which describes a calculated test which is designed to destroy. This same word pirazo is used throughout the Gospels. First of all, it's used to describe the devil coming with a calculated test to destroy someone. It's used to describe the tempter in the wilderness. When Jesus was tested by the devil, that's the Greek word perazo, the devil bringing a calculated test designed to take Jesus down. We find this word tempted, the word perazo, used to describe the activity of Pharisees and Sadducees in all four of the Gospels. They come to Jesus with calculated words, arguments, and questions that are designed to entrap Jesus, to destroy Jesus, to ruin his reputation, and to take him down. In other words, this is not an accidental attack. This is designed to destroy. It carries the idea of dev devastation, destruction. So you could actually translate James 1.13 like this. Let no man say when he, is tempted of, when he is tempted. 
or the Greek means, let no man say when he is being crushed, devastated, and destroyed. This word describes what these believers were going through. They were being crushed. They were being devastated. They felt they were being destroyed. And James says, let no man say, let no man say, stop it, stop it now. Let no man say when he's being crushed, devastated, and destroyed, I am being crushed, devastated, and destroyed of God. That word of in Greek had two possible words that could have been used. The first is the word hupo. That word was not used, but it's very important for you to understand it. If the word hupo had been used, it would have implied direct agency. In other words, it would have meant God himself is doing this destruction to us. God himself has arranged these circumstances that are crushing us. That's not the word that's used here. The word used here is the word apo. And the word apo means to do something from a distance, which means the believers were not directly accusing God, but they were indirectly accusing God. This word apo means from a distance, remotely, God is not personally doing it to us, but indirectly, God is allowing these tragic events to pass into our life. Of course, God directly, personally would never do such horrible things, but God is God, and God is sovereign, and if God wanted to stop it, God could stop it, and He didn't, and therefore, Apo, from a distance, remotely, God, in His great sovereign way, has allowed all of these tragic events for some strange reason to pass into our life. Well, that's a very religious way of thinking. And James says, stop it. Stop talking like this. How dare you speak like this? Let no man say, stop it, stop it now. And if you're thinking like that, you need to stop it. You are wrong. The Bible says, let no man say when his life is being crushed, devastated and destroyed, I am being permissively devastated and destroyed by the remote activity of God. God has allowed for some reason these events to happen to me. James says, stop this talk and stop it now. And then he continues to say, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Cannot be tempted is the Greek word eparasmos. Parasmos means to be tried or to be tempted. You put a privative on the front, that's the letter A, it becomes eparasmos. This is something that simply cannot happen. God cannot be tempted with evil. Nothing in God responds to evil. God has no experience with evil. Once evil tried to get into heaven in the person of Lucifer and God removed it, there is no evil in heaven. God doesn't have any evil. God doesn't have anything vile or destructive and therefore he cannot do anything destructive or vile or evil to anyone else. It simply is a theological impossibility. So if you've been taught that God somehow allowed terrible events to happen to you, you've been taught wrong. And in fact, this is so important that verse 16 says, do not err, my beloved brethren. On this point, don't make a mistake. This is so important because if you think that God has allowed your cancer, then you will embrace your cancer. If you think God allowed your divorce, or if you think God allowed your car accident, or if you think God allowed your tragedy, then rather than resist it, you'll try to embrace it with grace so that God can do His work in you. God didn't do it. God did not do it. God doesn't have any evil to use to tempt you with. That is clearly what James chapter 1 verse 13 says. God cannot be tempted with evil. He has no experience in evil, and therefore He tempts no man with evil simply is impossible. Then what does God give? James answers that question in verse 17. Look at verse 17. Every good and perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Notice how James begins. He says, hey, if you want to really know what comes from heaven, I'll tell you. Every good and perfect gift is from above. When he says every good, the word good is the Greek word agathos, which describes something that's good for you or something that is beneficial. This tells us, first of all, when God sends something your way, it's good for you and it will bring a benefit into your life. Now, you may say, well, I believe once in a while, maybe God would send something good my way. 
Oh, really? The Greek says every good gift. The word gift in Greek is the word dosis. It does not describe a singular gift, but rather it describes the habitual giving of God. You could actually translate every good habitual giving. This is what always comes out of God. If you want to know what God gives, the answer is here. Everything that comes from God brings a benefit. Everything that comes from God is good. And to make sure we really understand, he continues to add the words, every good gift and every perfect gift. The word perfect in Greek is the word teleon. The word teleon describes something that is mature, something that is complete, or something that is perfect. You could translate it like this. Every good habitual giving of God is completing. It is maturing. It is perfecting. Which means if it comes from heaven, it doesn't take from you. It adds to you. Now, let me give you a real simple test to help you understand. Does cancer add to your life or does it take? Hmm. It takes. It takes your health. It takes your time. It takes your money. It takes your family. Sickness takes, takes, takes. And therefore, it fails the test of James chapter 1, verse 17. If it comes from God, it's going to add to your life. It's going to be good for you. It's going to be beneficial. It's going to mature you, complete you, perfect you. What comes from God is maturing. It is completing. It is perfecting. All sickness takes. It fails the test. Disaster takes. It fails the test. But if it comes from God, it's good for you. It's beneficial. It's maturing. It's completing. And it is perfecting. That's what God gives every time. That's what the word gift means. The Greek word dosis, which describes what God habitually does. Wow, isn't this amazing? What else does verse 17 say? It says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Now he's speaking in comparative terms. What comes from above as opposed to what comes from below. From below, you may receive damage, destruction, ruin. But from above, you're going to receive something good, something beneficial, completing, maturing, perfecting. And then he says, and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. I love this phrase, cometh down. In Greek, it is the word katabino. It's a compound of two words. The word kata describes something that comes down so hard, it's dominating or it is subjugating. The word bino means to step down. It's the same word you would use to describe stepping down a flight of stairs. But when you compound the two words together, it means to come down. But because the prefix is the word kata, it's something that's coming down very hard. It's coming down so hard, it's dominating, it is subjugating. And in fact, cometh down, the Greek word katabino, was used in secular literature of the first century to describe a downpour or a downpour of rain. Have you ever been in a downpour of rain? When the rain is coming down so hard, you're dominated by it, you're subjugated by it. I grew up in the state of Oklahoma and we used to really have downpours. And when we were driving on the road, the rain would come down so hard and so heavy, you couldn't even see the taillights on the car in front of you. You couldn't see the road in front of you. You had to pull over and wait for the rain to let up because when that kind of rain is coming down, you're dominated, you're subjugated by it. That is the word which now James uses in verse 17 to describe how many good and perfect gifts God is sending our way. God is sending so many good and perfect gifts our way. His intention is to dominate us with goodness. A downpour of good and perfect gifts. That's what God wants for me. And that's what God wants for you. That's who he is. That's what he does. You say, well, wait a minute. If God is pouring good and perfect gifts all around me, why am I not occasionally hit by one of them? Well, you have to receive it by faith. In fact, Hebrews chapter 2 tells us we need to give more earnest heed to what we've heard, lest at any time those promises would slip us by. You've got to take them by faith. If you've got your mind in the gutter and you think God has orchestrated your problem, then you're not waiting to receive the goodness of God. You've got your mind and your thinking in the wrong place. But when you renew your mind to God's goodness and you're looking up and you're waiting for His goodness, then your faith is in a position to say, I'll take that gift, I'll take that gift, I'll take that gift, and you become a receiver of the goodness of God. You've got to renew your mind to right thinking. 
Um, James says every good and perfect gift is coming down like a constant downpour, a shower of goodness to dominate us, to subjugate us from the Father of lights as opposed to what comes from the Father of darkness. And then he adds these words, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. In Greek, when it says with whom, it's the word paru. The word par is from para, which means alongside, which means if you could get right alongside of God, para, if you could come right alongside of him as close as you can get to God and look right into his face, look right into his eyes, you would find on this subject of what God always, always, always gives and what God never, never, never gives, there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Now, what in the world does that phrase mean? No variableness, neither shadow of turning. Well, these words together were used technically to describe a Roman sundial. Have you ever seen a Roman sundial? A Roman sundial tells us what time of the day it is. As the sun moves, as the planet moves, the shadows continually are shifting. They're changing. Every time you look at the sundial, the shadow is in a different spot. Now James uses this illustration to tell us God is not like a Roman sundial. On the issue of what he gives and never gives, he's not moving all the time. It's a fixed statement. It is a fixed action. God never moves. There's no variableness. There's no shadow of turning, which means you don't need to stop and think when tragedy comes. Now, I wonder this time if this is from God or whether this is from the devil. I wonder if God is trying to teach me through this tragedy or whether this is from the enemy. You don't even have to stop and ask that question. If it's tragic, if it takes from you, if it destroys you, if it ruins you, it is not from God. That is emphatically what James says to all of us in James chapter 1 and verse 17. If it's good, if it's beneficial, if it's completing, maturing, perfecting, it is from God. And on this issue of what God always gives and what God never gives, there's no variableness neither shadow of turning. On this question, God never changes. His actions never move. He only gives good and perfect gifts. Now, this is very important because if you think God sent your tragedy, you'll embrace it and try to let it work in your life. That's exactly what the devil wants you to do. The devil wants to send something hideous to you in the name of God and make you think that God sent it. So that destruction will wreak havoc in your life. That's what the devil wants. But when you understand that evil is not from God, then you will resist it and say, no, that is not mine. What God gives is good. It's perfecting. It's completing. This fails the test. This is not from my heavenly father. I'm going to shove this right out of my life. Do you see how important it is for you to understand what God gives and what God never gives. We're out of time, but I'll be back in just a moment, and I'm going to pray for you. Do you feel stuck? Is there a situation that you're facing where God feels absent? Or maybe you face the same trial or test over and over again and can't seem to find your way out? You don't have to feel stuck anymore. In Rick Renner's series, How to Get Out of the Trap the Devil Set for You, you'll learn how God always comes through for those who trust Him. In this series, Rick shares insights and valuable lessons on how to get answers when you're stuck in a mess and how to stay free once you get out of a trap. This powerful teaching series will show you the practical ways to get unstuck and out of the trap the devil has set for you. Available in digital or physical formats starting at just $10. When you call or go online today, you can also get the book Life in the Combat Zone for just $17. Spiritual battles are unavoidable, and they can be intense. In the book, Life in the Combat Zone, you'll learn how to train and fight like an expert spiritual warrior, how to overcome fear, and how to persevere and trust in God in the middle of life's battles. Discover qualities you'll need to withstand the heat of the battle so you can emerge triumphant. Don't miss this special offer, how to get out of the trap the devil set for you, and Life in the Combat Zone. Call now, 1-800-742-5593, or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online right now, 1-800-742-5593. My name is Joel Renner, coming to you from Moscow, Russia. 
And I want to say thank you to all of our ministry partners. Your support is bringing about the revival of the Bible. Today, it seems church and society is moving away from the Bible and more and more toward motivational messages. Many people will read all kinds of self-help books while ignoring the Bible or simply making it another resource book. Our lives should be built on what the Bible has to say, and we desire that everyone experience a revival of the Bible in their lives. Over many decades, the support of our partners has helped plant many churches in different countries. Today, our central church is located in Moscow, Russia, and we provide trusted Bible teaching from the Bible as our only source of absolute truth. Moscow is a beautiful city of more than 20 million people. Our ministry is working to start several affiliate churches throughout this vast city so that the revival of the Bible can be expanded on this side of the world too. Will you consider joining us as a partner so that we can help bring a revival of the Bible to even more people right here at home as well as around the world? The vision you support and that we are here to accomplish is this, to take the gospel of Christ both to our nearby world into the ends of the earth. Please call 1-800-742-5593 or go online to rental.org. I love to teach on the subject of what God gives and what God never gives because when I finally understood James 1.13 and James 1.17, it totally changed my life. It gave me direction on what I'm to resist, what I'm to receive. It told me how I am to pray, what I'm to believe about the Bible and about the nature of God. It just cleared up everything for me. And if you really embrace the truth of James 1.13, that God never gives anything evil, and James 1.17, that God always gives that which is good and beneficial and perfecting, I guarantee you, it will change your life. When you understand what to believe, what to stand for, and what to reject, that really is your first step to getting out of any trap that the devil has set for you because you'll understand God did not set the trap. This is a work of the devil and God wants you to get out of that trap. What you believe on this issue is vitally important. Wow. I'm speaking to you for my series, which is called How to Get Out of the Trap the Devil Set for You. I want you to order this. I believe it should be a staple in your life. It comes with a great study guide. We're also offering you my book called Life in the Combat Zone, How to Survive, Thrive, and Overcome in the Midst of Difficult Situations. You can do it. These will help you, by the way. And if you need prayer, let us know how to pray for you. We're waiting to hear from you right now. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus for the truth of James 1.13 and James 1.17. I thank you that you do not give evil and you do give that which is good and perfecting in our lives. Help us to align our thinking with the truth so we can walk in freedom. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being with me today. It's so good to be with you every day. Remember Ecclesiastes 8.4. It says, where the word of a king is, there's power. Let the word of God release its power in your life today. And I'll see you in the next program.